Our message is entitled what? Who is real? Israel. Kind of a play on words there. Who is real? Israel. And this is a very important question. Basically what we're going to discover and what many of you have already determined through this seminar is that there are two very different systems, two very different what everyone? Systems for understanding Bible prophecy. And uh, one of those systems is oriented primarily at Israel and national Israel. And you have hundreds of thousands, millions of people today who are looking to the literal Middle East for the literal descendants of Abraham for God to fulfill all of his Old Testament, Old Covenant promises to them in a literal fashion. Well, anybody can look around and see that it's likely that that is not going to happen, at least in the current political climate. And so what's happened is a, 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 an invention called the rapture. An invention called the what, everyone? Rapture has been basically manufactured by religionists that says something like this. The only way that God is ever going to be able to fulfill all of his promises to literal Israel is if the church gets out of the way. And so what's happened is this, this manufactured, artificial, non-biblical doctrine called the rapture, the secret rapture, has been invented. And, and more or less what's going to happen is, whoop, the whole church is just going to disappear in a moment. And, uh, you know, as we've already talked about there in the Left Behind movie, which sort of popularized this view, you know, their clothes will be neatly folded, etc., etc. And then God, with the church out of the way, can fulfill his Old Testament, Old Covenant promises that he is duty-bound to fulfill to Israel. That's sort of the, the picture that, I mean, hundreds of thousands, millions of Christians have. But what I want to show you today is that that, at its core, is fundamentally flawed. That, at its core, is fundamentally flawed. God does have an Israel, and who that Israel is, is very clear and very plain from a biblical perspective. From a what kind of perspective, everyone? A biblical perspective. And so we're going to do an, a good old-fashioned Bible study this morning. Can you say amen to that? We're going to try and answer the question, who is real Israel? That's the question we're going to answer. And uh, to put it even more uh, succinctly and to the point, who and what is Israel today? Is modern-day Israel still the Israel of God? Now, when we use the term modern-day Israel, we're talking about those people that live in the geographic area of ancient Palestine, modern Israel, Jerusalem, etc. Those people, the literal genealogical descendants of Abraham, is that Israel on earth today? And what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at this as, from a biblical perspective. And I'd like to start in what you might uh, consider to be somewhat of an unusual place, Genesis chapter 1. Just a little bit of background here. Genesis chapter 1, we're going to look at a marvelous parallel between the experience of Adam, the experience of Noah, and the experience of Israel. Okay? Follow that. The experience of Adam, the experience of Noah, and the experience of Israel. So be beginning in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1, I need you to stay right with me. Genesis chapter 1 verse 1. It says, In the beginning God created the what, everyone? the heavens and the earth. Now notice verse 2. The earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the what, everyone? The waters. So when God begins to create, what he basically has is a large blob, a, a, a basically a vacuous void, and there's, it must have been covered in water because it says the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And so you see in your mind's eye here, just this large uh, sort of fluid mass. The Spirit of God is hovering over this large, fluid mass. And then, of course, God begins to create. Let there be light, and there was light, and He creates all of the various things. And then it comes time to create man. To create what, everyone? Man. And we pick that up in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. This was, of course, the sixth day of creation. Then God said, let us make man in what? Our image according to our likeness, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the things that creep on the earth, and over every creeping thing on the earth. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God he created him, male and female he created them. Then God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and what? multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And so I want you to get this picture in your mind. First there was a large fluid mass, and then God separated the, the, the fluid mass from waters that were below and waters that were above, something he calls the firmament. The what, everyone? Firmament, the word just means space, okay? So look at that in Genesis chapter 1, back to Genesis chapter 1. And notice it says in verse 5, God called the light day and the darkness he called night. So the evening and the morning were the what? 
first day. Now look at verse 6. Then God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. Verse 7. Thus God made the firmament and divided. He did what, everyone? He divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. So let's get the picture in our mind here. Here's this large fluid mass, and then God creates a firmament or a space. Just imagine the hand of God uh, uh, reaching into that firmament there, or into that fluid mass, and he separates like this the waters that were below the firmament, the waters that were what, everyone? Below, and then the waters that were above, and that firmament is called heaven or space. Okay? And then he goes through all of the rest. He creates the land and he creates the creatures on the land and he creates the sea and the creatures in the sea. And finally, he creates mankind. He creates what, everyone? Mankind. And he makes a man named Adam and he makes him out of the dirt. Okay? He forms him out of the dust of the ground. You can pick that up in Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. Look with me at verse 7. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7. It says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became what, everyone? A living being. And what was this man's name? Adam. Adam. And the word Adam means earthy or of the earth because he was taken out of the earth. Now, if this makes sense, everyone, say amen. So far, so good. So what God is looking for here is a person that is created in His image that will faithfully, dutifully, consistently obey His Word and thus be a representative to others of God and His goodness and His character. If that makes sense, say amen. Okay, but did Adam fail or succeed in this mission? He absolutely failed. And of course, uh, Adam failed and then they had uh, Cain and they had Abel and Seth. And of course, Cain ended up slaying who? Abel and the whole thing just went to hell in a handbasket, so to speak, down, 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 so that what happens in Genesis chapter 6, 7, uh, you basically find God saying that the world had become so debauched, so degenerated, so terrible, that the thoughts of their minds were only on evil continually. God said, I'm going to start over. I'm going to what, everyone? I'm going to start over. And so we go to Genesis chapter 6, Genesis chapter 6. Beginning in verse 1, Now it came to pass when men began to multiply in the face of the earth, and the daughters were born to them. The sons of God saw the daughters of men, and, they and that they were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit will not always strive with man forever, for he indeed is flesh, and his days will be what? A hundred and twenty years. Jump down to verse 5. Then the Lord saw the wickedness of man, that it was great on the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only what? Evil. How often? Continually. So God looks out at this beautiful world that he had created and what had happened basically, Adam was disloyal. Adam had failed and then right down the line, every descendant of Adam got worse and worse and worse and worse and worse until finally God looked out and he said, everyone is thinking about evil only continually except he had a few faithful and God said, I'm going to start over. I'm going to hit control, alt, delete. I'm going to reset the hard drive and begin again. And so he sends this thing called the flood. Called the what, everyone? Flood. Called the flood. Now we're there in Genesis chapter 7. I want you to notice the similarities. Genesis chapter 7, and I'll pick it up in verse 11. Genesis chapter 7 and verse 11. In the 600th, 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, on that day the fountains of the great deep were broken up and the windows of heaven were opened. Now it begins to rain. Look at verse 12. And the rain was on the earth for how many days and nights? Now get this picture in your mind here. It's actually quite a fascinating one. It says here that when the rains came, they not only came from above, it says the fountains of the deep were opened or loosed. Now let's get the picture in our mind here. When God originally created planet Earth, He had this fluid mass. He had a what, everyone? And then He reached His hands in and He separated the waters that were above from the waters that were underneath. Does that make sense, everyone? So there's water up here and there's water down here. If that makes sense, say amen. But look at what's happening in the flood. In the flood, it says, the windows of heaven were open, so now the waters are coming down. And it says, the fountains of the deep were open, and so now the water's coming up. And the whole earth is once again covered by what? Do you see the similarity, yes or no? So God is basically undoing creation. In creation, he began by inserting his hands, so to speak, and he brought a separation. In the flood, he brings those same waters right back together, from above and from beneath. If that makes sense, say amen. Now, you're still there in Genesis chapter 7. Genesis chapter 7, I'm picking it up in verse 19. And the waters prevailed exceedingly on the earth, and all the high hills under the whole heaven were what? Covered. So the water, pardon me, the earth was covered in what? Water. So it was a giant, fluid mass. 
just exactly what you had in Genesis, a giant fluid mass. Except in Genesis, he separated the waters, uh, Genesis 1 and 2, he separated the waters, and in Genesis 6 and 7, he brings the waters back together. Are we all together, everyone? Yes or no? Fascinating, look at verse 20. The waters prevailed 15 cubits upward and the mountains were covered. So the whole earth was a giant fluid mass. Now remember, go back just so you can see the similarity here. Look at Genesis chapter 1. Keep your finger right there. Look at Genesis chapter 1 and notice with me verse 2. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 2. It says, And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the what? Deep. And what was hovering over the face of the waters? The Spirit of God hovered over the face of the waters in creation. Now look at Genesis chapter 8 verse 1. Genesis chapter 8 verse 1. Then God remembered Noah and every living thing and all the animals that were with him in the ark, and God made a what? A wind to pass over the what? The earth, and the waters subsided or disappeared. That word wind is the word breath. It's the same word that is frequently translated spirit. And so it's very fascinating here. In Genesis 1 and 2, you have this fluid mass, the Spirit of God hovering over it, and the waters are separated. In Genesis chapter 6 and 7, the waters come back together. God puts His Spirit over them and they begin to subside. And so what God is doing here is He is restarting creation. He's restarting what, everyone? Cre absolutely fascinating. And so in, in the beginning, God's intention was that Adam would live a faithful life, that Adam would live an obedient life, that Adam would live a righteous life, and thus be a legitimate representative of God's character. If that makes sense, say amen. But Adam failed. Isn't that true? Adam failed. So God here is going to restart. He's going to reset the hard drive. And he's got a new man. And that new man's name is Noah. Noah. That's exactly right. So you're there in Genesis chapter 9. Genesis chapter 9. And we'll pick it up in verse 18. Genesis chapter 9, verse 18. Now the sons of Noah who were, went out of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And Ham was the father of Canaan. These three were the sons of Noah, and from these the whole earth was what? Populated. Now look at verse 20. Absolutely amazing. And Noah began to be a what? A farmer, and he planted a vineyard. Noah worked the soil. Question, what did Adam do in the garden? He, that's exactly right. He, he, his job was to tend the garden, to take care of the garden, to have dominion over the garden. And it says too, here's Noah, and he is a tender or a keeper of the soil. Fascinating. Now look at verse 21. It says, then he drank of the wine and became what? Drunk, and he became uncovered in his tent. And so it's actually quite fascinating here. God began in the beginning there with a man in a garden who fell because of fruit. And he restarts the creation process. And here we have God has his new man, Noah. And he begins, Noah's going to be his guy. Noah's going to be his representative. But right out of the gates, he plants a vineyard. He harvests those vineyards. He becomes what? Drunk and lets the plan down. Fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. Adam lost this whole thing on the issue of appetite. Noah here fails on the issue of appetite. And so God begins with Adam. Adam's my guy, Adam fails. He moves to Noah, resets the whole creation process. Noah's my guy, Noah fails. If this makes sense, say amen. Now the next big player to come on the scene is Israel. Go to Genesis chapter 2. Pardon me, Genesis chapter 32. God called a man and his name was Abraham. What was his name, everyone? Abraham. Abraham had a son. That was the promised son. His name was Isaac or Isaac, which means laughter. So God called Abraham out of Babylon. Where did he call him from, everyone? Babylon. Let's see if we can find that here. Abraham was called out of Babylon. In the Bible, it's called the Ur of the Chaldees. God is looking for a representative on earth who will truly live righteously, who will truly live faithfully, who will be a true representative of God on earth. He tried it with Adam. Adam failed. He tried it with Noah. Noah failed. And so he calls a man named Abraham. And Abraham gives birth to Isaac. And I give, Isaac gives birth to who? Jacob. But Jacob was a deceiver. The word Jacob means deceiver, it means supplanter, one who grabs at the heel. And you know the story perhaps of Jacob. Jacob ran off, you remember, he went over there to Laban and he stayed a time with Laban and when he returned back, it was sort of this very difficult conflict with his brother, what was his brother's name? Esau. So we pick it up in Genesis chapter 32. Genesis chapter 32. And it says there, beginning in verse 1, And Jacob went on his way and the angels of God met him. 
When Jacob saw them, he said, This is God's camp, and they called the name of the place Menaim. Uh, uh, Mahanaim. Verse 3, Then Jacob sent messengers before him to Esau his brother in the land of Seir, the country of Edom. And he commanded them, saying, Speak thus to uh, my lord Esau. Thus your servant Jacob says, I have dwelt in Laban and stayed there until now. I have oxen and donkeys and flocks and female servants and male servants. And I have uh, sent to tell the Lord that I may find favor in your sight. Jacob, frankly, is scared to death. He had stolen the birthright uh, illegitimately, uh, not the birthright so much. He had taken the birthright in an illegitimate manner, definitely, but he had taken the blessing of his father in an illegitimate manner. He had fleed from the place of Esau because Esau was going to kill him, and now he's coming back after 20 years. How many years, everyone? 20 years. And so he sends a messenger out that basically says, go out there and cool Esau down. Cool him down. Let him know that, you know, we'll give him offerings, we'll give him whatever he needs, just get that guy cooled down. So the message is sent out, and Esau and the, the camp of Esau and the camp of Jacob are approaching, they're approaching, they're approaching, they're approaching, and Jacob, frankly, is scared. And so he takes some time to go off and to seek God by himself. To go seek what, everyone? God by himself. Look at verse 22 of Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter, pardon me, 32. I misspoke. Genesis 32, verse 22. Genesis 32, verse 22. And he arose that night and he took his two wives, his two female servants and his 11 sons and crossed over the ford of Jabbok. He took them and sent over the brook and he sent them, uh, he sent over whatever he had, verse 24. Then Jacob was left alone and a man wrestled with him until what? The breaking of the day. Verse 25, now when he saw that he did not prevail against him, he touched the socket of his hip and the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him, verse 26. And Jacob said, or pardon me, and he said, let me go for the day breaks. But he said, I will not let you go unless you what? Bless me, verse 27. So he said to him, what is your name? And he said, what? Jacob, it's very fascinating to notice that God here says, what is your name? That is the very question that he had been asked 20 years before when he'd walked in there before Isaac. And Isaac said, what is your name? And he said, my name is Esau. He said, what is your name? My name is Esau. What is your name? My name is Esau. Three times he was asked what his name is as he was trying to take the uh, birthright from his brother Esau in an illegitimate surreptitious way. What's your name? Esau. What's your name? Esau. What's your name? Esau. 20 years later, God brings him over the same ground and he says, what's your name? God does the same for us, by the way. God wanted to see if he had learned this hard lesson. He says, what is your name? And notice what he says. He said what? Jacob, which means deceiver. I'm a deceiver. I'm a thief. I'm a liar. I'm a sinner. I need a savior is basically what he's saying. He said, Jacob. And he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob. But what? Israel. That is the first time that the word Israel occurs in the whole Bible right there. That is the first use of the word Israel in the entire Bible right there. Genesis chapter 32, verse 28. Your name shall no longer be called Jacob, which is a, a supplanter or deceiver or, or dishonest person, but Israel and the name Israel. Very fascinating here. Let's see if we can put it up on the screen. The name Israel means he prevails over God or he rules with God. Israel. One who reigns with God. One who has prevailed with God. That's what it means. You find many names in the Bible that have that E-L in it. Daniel and Nathaniel and Elijah and Elisha. That E-L comes from Elohim, which is God. And so here you have the, the putting together in Israel. You have this putting together of one who is overcoming, one who is a victor, one who rules, one who prevails, and El, which is the short of Elohim, with God or against God or for God. And so the name Israel means one who has prevailed with God. And you say amen. That's what the name means. It's the first time in the whole Bible that the word Israel is used here. He says, your name is no longer Jacob, but Israel, for you have struggled with God and with men and have what, everyone? Prevailed. Verse 29, and Jacob asked and said, tell me your name, I pray. And he said, what is it that you, why is it that you ask about my name? It's basically interesting here because he had said, what is your name? He is brought, bringing him back over that ground. What is your name? What is your name? My name is Esau. My name is Esau. And so he says to him, what is your name? My name is Jacob. And then Jacob turns to him and says, what's your name? And it's as if God is saying, I'm not the one on trial here. <laughs> it don't matter what my name is. 
You know how that is whenever you're in trouble, you know, and someone's asking you hard questions, you know, you try to, you know, hoo, 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 avoid by asking questions of them. And God basically says, hey, <laughs> you are not the one cross-examining me. I am the one cross-examining you. What is your name? My name is Jacob. I'm a liar. I'm a deceiver. I'm a supplanter. I'm a sinner. And he says, your name is no longer that. Now your name is Israel, one who has prevailed with God. And that's what that wrestling symbolized, that this man had gained a spiritual victory when he admitted that he was a sinner in need of God's assistance and help. If that makes sense, say amen. So this is the very first time that the word Israel occurs in all of the Bible. And so notice this. I want you to grasp onto this. The name Israel was first given to a single man, Jacob, who gained a what? Spiritual victory. I want you to note that. Note that very, 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 very well. The first time Israel is used in the whole Bible, it was when a single man gained a spiritual victory. When a what, everyone? Single man gained what kind of a victory? Spiritual victory. Now, of course, Israel had children. The 12 tribes and, and that name Israel, that was the, the, the name of Jacob, came to mean all of the descendants of Jacob and thus a nation called the nation of what? Israel. But here's the important point. In the beginning, in the very first original use of the phrase Israel, it was one man who gained a spiritual victory. If that makes sense, say amen. It only became a nation, and you can check that out in Exodus. Go with me to Exodus. Exodus, let's see if we can find it here. Chapter 1, Exodus chapter 1. Jacob had sons. One of those sons was Joseph. Joseph, you know the story, went down into Egypt and the children of Israel dwelt in Egypt for a long period of time and then they were called out and that calling out is called the Exodus. Okay, does that make sense, everyone? So that's what we find in Exodus chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. Now these are the names of the children of who? Israel, who came to Egypt, each man in his household came with who? Jacob. Do you see that? So Exodus begins with a listing of all of the descendants of Israel, but Israel was the new name of Jacob, and the name Israel was a spiritual term that applied to a single man that gained what kind of a victory? Spiritual, spiritual victory. Are we all on the same page, everyone? So now you go to Exodus chapter 4. Exodus chapter 4, and notice with me verse 22. Exodus chapter 4, verse 22, and this is the first verse that I'm personally aware of where God refers to Israel as a national identity, okay? Not just the descendants of Israel, not just the children of Israel, but here the, the, the nation of Israel having a national uh, corporate identity. I'm in Exodus chapter 4, and I'm noting verse 22. Then you shall say to Pharaoh, God speaking to Moses, thus says the Lord, Israel is my what? My son, Israel is my what? My son, and no, notice what it says after that, my firstborn. Does everyone see that, yes or no? Israel is my son, my firstborn, verse 23, so I say to you, let my son go. I'm in Exodus chapter 4, verse 23, let my son go that he may serve me, but if you refuse to let him go, I will indeed kill your son, your firstborn. And so God here takes Israel, national Israel, the descendants of Jacob, the descendants of the one man Israel, and he says that they're all my son. They're all my what, everyone? My son. And then he says they're the firstborn. Now, sometimes we have the misunderstanding that the word firstborn means the one that's born first. Firstborn does not necessarily mean born first. First is not only a chronological term, it's also a term of preeminence. Think of it this way. George Bush's wife is named what? Barbara, right? She's the first lady. Does that mean she's the first lady that was ever created? No, what it means is she's the most important lady. She's the most preeminent lady in this country. And so the firstborn is not necessarily the one who was born first. It's the one who is chiefest and most preeminent among those who were born. Does that make sense, everyone? So he's my firstborn. Incidentally, Jacob was called the firstborn, but Esau was born first. You follow that line of reasoning, everyone? Very simple. Now, God here calls Israel out of Egypt. God calls Israel out of what, everyone? Egypt. But here's the thing I want you to notice. Israel has transitioned from a single man who gained what kind of a victory? A spiritual victory to a national corporate identity. 
Okay? Now, let's pick up, let's review very quickly here because what we're going to move into next is absolutely, totally, completely phenomenal and biblical. And if you'll follow it through, you will see with new eyes who Israel really is. You will see who is real, Israel. Now, God began in the beginning with a man named Adam. God's plan for Adam was he'll be my representative, he'll live righteously, he'll live faithfully on earth, and everyone can look to Adam as my representative. Adam failed. Adam what, everyone? Failed. So God hits Control-Alt-Delete, rewinds the whole thing, starts afresh, and he has the flood, which was the reversal of creation, and he has a man named what? Noah, and Noah failed too. Interestingly, he failed in the very same way, didn't he? Because Adam had failed on the issue of fruit, the issue of appetite, and Noah failed when his fruit made him drunk and he fell. Okay? So he whoop, hits control, alt, delete, he restarts creation. Noah, this is my guy, this is my representative, this is the one who will live righteously, this is the one that everyone can look to as my man, and he failed. So God starts over and he calls a man named Abraham. And Abraham uh, begot Isaac. And Isaac begot Jacob. Jacob becomes Israel. And so Israel becomes God's new representative on earth. Israel becomes what, everyone? God's new representative. So we have Adam. And then we have Noah. And then we have what? Israel. So let's say that together. Adam. And then Noah. And then Israel. Did Adam fail or succeed? He failed. Okay. Did Noah fail or succeed? He failed. Now that doesn't mean that these people's whole lives were failures. But it does mean that, that they did commit sins in such a way that they could not be God's supreme representative on earth. Because how many times do you have to sin before you have misrepresented God? Yeah, one time. Because how many times has God sinned? None. So one failure disqualifies you to be a perfect representative of a perfectly infinite God. And so Adam failed and Noah failed and God calls Israel. Now, Israel is basically the center of much of the Old Testament, okay? But what I want you to understand is that national Israel began as a single man who gained what? A spiritual victory. You've got it. A single man from a single man to a whole nation. From a single man to a whole nation. And the word Israel means one who has prevailed with God, one who has overcome. Now, are we all together, everyone? Yes or no? Now, some people say, well... Modern Israel today, over in ancient Palestine, that is still God's Israel on earth. I'm going to show you today that that is not God's Israel on earth. Does God have faithful people that live in the geographical area of Israel? Sure he does. God has faithful people in Jamaica. God has faithful people in Russia. God has faithful people in Sweden. God even has a few faithful people right here in Sterling Heights. Can you say amen? God has faithful people everywhere, but as a nation, Israel had a covenant and they did not satisfy the, 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 the stipulations of that covenant. And we read about that in Daniel chapter 9, verse 24, when the angel Gabriel said to Daniel, 70 weeks are what? Determined for your people and for your holy city. Who were Daniel's people? Israel. And what city is being referred to here? Jerusalem. And so God gave them 70 weeks, 490 years. And we've already looked at this. It began in 457 B.C. Here's that time that was especially cut off for the Jews right here. Ended in 34 A.D. Very, very powerfully here. Jesus was baptized in 27 A.D. Just as we've already said, that was the end of the 69 weeks. He was cut off in the middle of the week, but not for himself. Can you say amen to that? He caused sacrifice and oblation to cease. How come he caused that to cease? Because he was the true Lamb of God, and there's no point in bringing these foreshadowing sacrifices to the temple anymore. If that makes sense, say amen. God continued that covenant for another three and a half years and finally concluded in 34 AD when Stephen was stoned and the leaders of national Israel plugged their ears and said, blah, 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 we're not going to listen to anything you say, blah, blah, blah. And then he was stoned and the gospel then goes to the who? Gentiles. And so right out of Daniel chapter 9, it's just as plain as the noonday sun that God did have a covenant with Israel, but that was not an unconditional covenant. It was a covenant that was conditioned upon their obedience. And you can read all about that in Deuteronomy. There were the covenant curses and the covenant blessings. If they were faithful, the blessings. If they were disobedient, the curses. And so we see in Daniel chapter 9, Matthew 21, and Matthew chapter 24, this very consistent, consistent theme 
In Daniel 9, the Messiah was rejected. The very next thing is the city was destroyed. Jesus tells a parable in Matthew chapter 21. He said the Messiah will come, he will be rejected, and he even asked them, what would you do under the similar circumstances? And they said, I, I would miserably destroy those people. And he says, have you never read? Have you never read that the stone that the builders rejected has become the chief of the corner? This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. And then he says there in Matthew chapter 21 and verse 43, therefore, the kingdom of heaven will be taken away from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. Jesus foresaw that the nation of Israel, the what did I say, everyone? The nation of Israel was sealing their fate by not receiving the Messiah of Israel. And then in Matthew chapter 24, the Messiah was rejected. He said, behold, your house is left unto you desolate. He goes out in Matthew chapter 24. The disciples try to cheer him up. Oh, look at all the beautiful buildings. And he says, do you see all this? You see all these buildings? You see all of this grandeur and glory, these marvelous buttressed edifices? They will all be destroyed. Not one will be left upon another. The Messiah was rejected. The city was destroyed. That's a consistent theme. Messiah rejected, city destroyed. Messiah rejected, city destroyed. Messiah rejected, city destroyed. If that makes sense, say amen. Very simple. So the Messiah was rejected. Israel did not fulfill its covenant promise. And so God moved to the Gentiles and he gave a very powerful, very sad, very unfortunate, very avoidable judgment in 70 AD when Jerusalem was destroyed by the Roman general Titus and it was a final judgment upon Israel. The Jewish Christians perceived that. They knew for a fact that that is exactly what had happened. Well, this raises the question. If Adam failed, and if Mo Noah failed, and if Israel failed, and they did fail, do we now have to believe that modern-day Israel, uh, that is Israel over there in Palestine, is still God's Israel, and God's just waiting for them to get their act together, and, oh, it's going to be difficult for that to happen in the present political climate, and so we've got to, mm, how are we going to do this? How are we going to pull this off? I've got a great idea. Let's manufacture something called the rapture so we can get the church out of the way, and then God can fulfill all of His covenant promises to Israel? Beloved, there's a much easier way to understand the Bible. Can you say Amen. I mean, beloved, oh, well, we do not have to go through this circuitous maze of, well, how, can God, how, how are we going to make sense out of the Old Testament? I'm going to show you right now how to make sense out of the Old Testament and what happens to all of those promises that God made to Israel. God has a new Israel, and that Israel was faithful. You say, what is he talking about? Who's this new Israel that was faithful? Well, let's take a look at who it is. I'm going to Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1. You say, who is God's new Israel? I'll let the cat out of the bag and make it crystal clear to you. Jesus Christ is God's new Israel. Jesus Christ is Israel. Remember, let, let's go back and remember this. Israel was originally a term that applied to what? A single man who gained what kind of a victory? A spiritual victory. And what was God looking for in Israel? What was God looking for in Noah? What was God looking for in Adam? A fit representative on earth. And he finds it in the man Jesus Christ. Now let's just think a little bit about Israel. How Israel, national Israel, came to be. A man named Joseph had dreams. A man named Joseph had what? Dreams. And the children of Israel were led down into Egypt for a time. Isn't that true, everyone? Whoa, let's think about our own Lord. Let's think about our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. His mother's name was what? Mary, and his earthly father's name was what? Joseph, and Joseph has a dream. An angel appears to him and says, someone's going to try to hurt the child. Take the child to guess where? Take the child to Egypt. And just as national Israel stayed in Egypt for a time, Jesus remained in Egypt for a time until another dream came to him, and he said, listen, the, the one who sought to kill Jesus has now died. You can bring him out. You can bring him what, everyone? Out of Egypt. Absolutely fascinating. So Jesus, uh, a man named Joseph had dreams and they were led into Egypt. He remained in Egypt for a time. Then he was called out of Egypt. Then he passes through the water. Now let's think about that for just a moment. After the Exodus, when, when Pharaoh finally relented and let, it, let uh, the, the children of Israel go, where was the first place they came to? What was the first major thing that happened? The Red Sea. That's exactly right. They come to the Red Sea. And uh, they say, oh, you know, we're so confused. You know, we have uh, impassable on the right and impassable on the left. And, and we have, or rather, impassable on the right and impassable on the left. I do know my right and my left. That's left. And uh, the, 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 the armies of Pharaoh are approaching very rapidly from behind and God parts the Red Sea right in front of them. Can you say amen? amen? So look at this. They go into Egypt. They stay in Egypt. They're called out of Egypt. They go to the Red Sea. 
Now, it's very interesting. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Keep your finger here in Matthew because we're going to come back. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10 very quickly. See if you can beat me there. You didn't. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and I'm in verse 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the what? Sea. He's talking about Israel. All were what? Baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the what? See, so it's very interesting. Paul here takes this passing through the Red Sea and he parallels it with a baptism experience, which is what Scotty talked about in Sabbath school this morning. And so he says the Red Sea was like a baptism. The Red Sea was like a what, everyone? Baptism. And it comes from the Greek word baptizo, which means to emerge. And so Paul takes this passing through the Red Sea and he says it was just like a baptism. Now, after Jesus was called out of Egypt, the next thing that we basically see Jesus doing in the Gospel of Matthew is being baptized. Are you with me, everyone? Very next thing we see is him being baptized. So I'm in Matthew. You can go back to Matthew with me. Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3, picking it up in verse 13. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. And John tried to prevent him, saying, I need to be baptized by you. You are coming to me. But Jesus answered and said, Permit it to be so for now, for thus it is fitting for us to what? For thus it is fitting for us to what? Fulfill. Now, if you're in the custom of writing in your Bible, I'm going to recommend that you take out a pen and you underline that word fulfill right there. Put a star by it, put something by it, because that word fulfill is arguably the single most important word in the Gospel of Matthew. I'll show you that in just a moment. Jesus comes there, he says, hey, listen, I need you to baptize me. He says, no, 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 I need to be baptized by you. And he says, listen, we've got to do this so we can fulfill all righteousness. And then it says, he allowed him. And when he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water. And behold, the heavens were opened to him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. Now look at verse 17. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, this is my beloved what? Son in whom I am what? Well pleased. So Jesus is the Son of God. Question, question, question. Who was the Son of God in Exodus chapter 4? Israel, that's right, remember? That's what Moses said to Pharaoh. Let my children go, my son, my firstborn, Israel. And God here says, here's my son, and I'm happy with him. And just as the national Israel had gone into Egypt because a man named Joseph dreamed dreams, they remained in Egypt for a time. They were called from Egypt. They passed through the water. So to Jesus, a man named Joseph has dreams. They go into Egypt. They stay in Egypt for a time. They're called out of Egypt. As he comes out of Egypt, he goes to the waters of what? Baptism. Fascinating. Now, where do the children of Israel go after they pass through the Red Sea? They go to Mount Sinai. Okay? And in the context of Mount Sinai, God gives them the law. And then they go into the wilderness for how many years? 40 years. What does Jesus do immediately after his baptism? He goes into the wilderness and the Bible says he was led by the what? Spirit for the purpose of being tempted. Now do you see that Jesus here is retracing the high points of Israel's national history? Yes or no? Fascinating. Just as, just as Israel was in the wilderness for 40 years, Jesus goes in to the wilderness for 40 days. Why is Jesus walking over step by step the high points of Israel's national history? Because he's the new Israel and he knows it. A single man who gains a what kind of victory? A spiritual victory so he could be God's representative on earth. Fascinating. 40 days in the wilderness. Now let's go to that. You're there in Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4. Satan comes to Jesus. He gives him three temptations. How many temptations? Three. three temptations. The first one he says, hey, listen, cause that these stones be made into bread. Make these stones into bread. But notice what Jesus says in verse 44. It is written, man shall not, man shall not live by what? Bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the what? Mouth of God. Do you know where he's quoting from? He's quoting from the book of Deuteronomy. He's quoting from the... You know what the word Deuteronomy means? It means the second law. De is to, namos is law. Deuteronomy is the second rendering or the second reading of the law. It's basically Moses, three sermons. Moses recapitulates the whole history of national Israel. And Jesus here is in the wilderness. The devil says, make these stones into bread. And Jesus actually quotes from the very experience of the children of Israel by quoting Deuteronomy. He says, no, it is written. We don't live by bread alone. We don't live by manna alone, but by all of the words that come from God. Jesus here is being tempted in the very same area that Adam was tempted in, the area of appetite. Adam failed because of fruit. 
Noah failed because part of the fruit of the vineyard, and the devil comes and he says, oh man, I've been down this road before. God gets his representative. I mean, been there, done that. Here's another control, alt, delete. And he says, I'll trip him up the same way I tripped up Adam. I'll trip him up the same way I tripped up Noah. And he says, hey, listen, you're really hungry. Why don't you eat? And he was totally unprepared for what came next. It is written, Satan. And he goes back to the experience of Israel in the wilderness and he quotes from Deuteronomy where Israel had failed, Christ succeeded. Amen. And then he was tempted again. Look at this, absolutely fascinating. We pick it up there in verse 7. Jesus said to him, It is written again, you shall not what? Tempt the Lord your God. That's, that's from Deuteronomy as well. That's straight out of Deuteronomy. Remember what had happened? The, the children of Israel were walking out and, uh, and uh, they, were, they were on their way to Mount Sinai and they came to this bitter water. And uh, they said, oh, Moses, you led us here to die in this bitter, sour-tasting, sulfuric water. Oh. And, and God, Moses basically said, hey, listen, you're tempting God, you're chiding God, you're testing God. The name of that place was Masa and Meribah. Masa means temptation, Meribah means chiding. And it says, don't tempt the Lord like you did in Massa. God does not lead you out of the wilderness in a place to die. Can you say amen? That's true for every one of you. God might be leading you out somewhere, but God never leads you somewhere just to kill you and let you die. Someone say amen. amen. God leads you with a purpose. And if God has been leading us point by point by point by point, we are testing God when we doubt the leading that God has in our lives. Can you say amen? amen. And so Jesus here says, no, it is written. You shall not test or tempt the Lord your God. He's quoting from the very experience in Exodus chapter 17 where Israel had failed. Jesus succeeded. And then one more. Look at this in verse 10. Away with you, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you uh, serve. Again, guess what book he's quoting from? Deuteronomy chapter 6 and chapter 10. That's exactly right. And so, let's follow it through. A man named Joseph has dreams. This leads them into Egypt. They remain in Egypt for a time. God calls them out of Egypt. They pass through the waters of baptism. Then they go into the what, everyone? Into the wilderness where he is basically for faced with a series of tests that were exactly like the tests that Israel, national Israel, faced and failed. But where Israel failed, Jesus said, It is written, I'm going to trust the Lord. It is written, I'm going to trust my Father. It is written, I'm going to trust God. Amen? He is rehearsing the history, of, the history of Israel. Quotes from Deuteronomy, he overcomes where Israel failed. Absolutely fascinating. I could give you other parallels, but this short, sort of gets you off the ground. Now, you're still there in Matthew. I want to show you something amazing. What word did I tell you was the most... By the way, no, 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 no. Before we go to Matthew, go to Luke. Got to show you this. Got to show you this. Luke chapter 4. Look at Luke as Luke rehearses the experience of the baptism, he gives us a detail that Matthew doesn't. Luke chapter 4, what chapter, everyone? Luke chapter 4. You have got to see this. Amazing stuff. Luke chapter 4, and it says in verse 12. We'll pick it up in verse 12. This is the temptation experience. It has been said, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Now when the devil ended every temptation, he departed uh, from him until an opportune time. Verse 14, Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee. News of him went throughout all the surrounding region and he taught in their synagogues and was glorified by all. Now look at verse 16. So he came to where? Nazareth, Nazareth where he had been brought up and as his custom was, he went into the what? Synagogue on what day? Sabbath day and he stood up to read. Every one of you today who's in the church on the Sabbath is following the example of Jesus. Can you say amen? If it's good enough for Jesus, it's good enough for me. Verse 17. And he was handed the book of the prophet what? Isaiah, and when he had opened the book, now I want you to notice what it says here, he found the place where it was written. Now, I don't know if they had a specific scripture reading for that day, but they hand the scroll to Jesus, and Jesus didn't read whatever was assigned for that day. Jesus went through that scroll and found a certain passage. You with me, everyone? He found a passage that is from Isaiah chapter 61. Of course, there weren't chapters in those days, but it's the equivalent of Isaiah chapter 61. And I want you to notice, Jesus reads it. This is out of this world amazing. Verse, 60, uh, verse 18, he says, The Spirit of the Lord is what? Upon me. Because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. If you go back to Isaiah chapter 61, that is a prophecy about the servant of Yahweh. In Isaiah 61, do you know who the servant of Yahweh is? Israel! 
Isaiah basically beginning in 42 all the way to the end of Isaiah are these fantastic prophecies that God had envisioned for Israel, national Israel, but which unfortunately they failed, they failed, they failed. Jesus walks into the temple right after his 40 days in the wilderness, right after overcoming by quoting from Deuteronomy. He goes into the temple, they hand him Isaiah, he finds this place and he begins to quote Isaiah 61, which everybody in the synagogue knew was a reference to the servant of Yahweh. It's Israel! But watch what Jesus says. Whoo, they were totally unprepared for this. Verse 20, Then he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down, and the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. There must have been something about the way he read it. I mean, in my mind's eye, I just see Jesus quietly handing the scroll back to the individual there and going and sitting down, and everybody's... pin drop silence. It must have been an uncomfortable moment in the synagogue as people are thinking, that's it? That's it? Notice what Jesus says. Out of this world, verse 21. And he said to them, what's the first word? Yes. Today, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Whoa, 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 whoa. what did he say? What did he say? Did he just say that this marvelous prophecy about the servant of Yahweh that definitely refers to Israel in its original context, did he just say that today the scripture is fulfilled in our ears? Is he telling us he's the servant of Yahweh? Is he telling us that he is God's new Israel? That's exactly what he's saying. He says today this scripture is fulfilled in your ears. That scripture was fulfilled in Jesus. Where national Israel failed, Jesus Christ, God's Son, His true representative, the true Israel, the one who has prevailed with God, where national Israel failed, Jesus succeeded. By the way, go back to Matthew now. You thought I was going to forget, but I didn't, did I? Go back to Matthew. Phenomenal. You know what the most important word? What's the most important word in the whole book of Matthew? Okay, get ready. Stretch your fingers out. Here we go. Matthew chapter 1, I'm in verse 22. Matthew chapter 1, verse 22. Write all these down. This is going to be fast, so hang in there. Matthew 1, 22. So all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. That's Isaiah 7, 14. Matthew says, Isaiah 7, 14, fulfilled in Jesus. Can you say amen? Okay, it gets even better. I'm going to Matthew chapter 2. Matthew what chapter, everyone? Two, and I'm going to pick it up in verse 13. Now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, and flee to Egypt, and stay there until I bring you word. For Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. When he arose, he brought the young child and his mother by night, and departed for Egypt. And he was there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord uh, through the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt I have called my what? Son. That's Hosea 11.1. Hosea 11, 1, look at verse 16. Then Herod, when he saw that he was deceived by the wise men, was exceedingly angry, and he sent forth and put to death all the male children who were in Bethlehem and all the districts uh, from two years old and under, according to the time which he had determined from the wise men. Verse 17, then was what? Fulfilled what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet, saying, A voice was heard in Ramah, lamentation and bitter weeping, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be comforted because there were no more. So here Matthew says, this happened to Jesus to fulfill what this prophet said. This happened to Jesus to fulfill what this prophet said. This happened to Jesus to fulfill what this prophet said. You think that's all? No, 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 no. Look at the verse 23. And they came and dwelt in a city called what? Nazareth, that it might be what? Fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. He shall be called a... Nazarene, Judges chapter 13, verse 5. You know what's happening now? It's amazing. Matthew's actually taking not just Messianic prophecies, he's taking just random bits of history from Israel, and he's saying, fulfilled in Jesus, fulfilled in Jesus, fulfilled in Jesus, fulfilled in Jesus. This is the single most important word in all of Matthew. Let's look at another one. You're there in Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4, notice with me verse 14. Matthew chapter 4, verse 14. That it might be, what's the next word? Fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, The land of Zebulun, the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who sat in darkness have seen a what? Great light. And those who sat in the region, the shadow of death, the light has dawned. He says that was fulfilled in Jesus. Go to Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. Jesus says, Do not think that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy them, but to do what? 
I came to fulfill the law and the prophets. That's the Old Testament. And then he says in verse 18, For verily I say unto you, not one jot or one tittle shall in any wise be removed from the law until all is what? Fulfilled. Okay, that's Matthew chapter 5. Look at Matthew chapter 8, verse 17. Matthew chapter 8. Can you keep up with me, yes or no? You're doing your best. Matthew chapter 8, verse 17. It says that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, He himself took our infirmities and bore our what? Sicknesses. Now, come on, Bible students, encourage me. Where's that taken from? Isaiah chapter 53. So Jesus here says, actually, Matthew says about Jesus, this happened, it was fulfilled. Fulfilled in Jesus. What the Old Testament prophets looked forward to, fulfilled in Jesus, fulfilled in Jesus, fulfilled in Jesus. Look at Matthew chapter 13, verse 35. 1335. You're right there with me. 1335. Notice what it says. Matthew chapter 13 and verse 35. Uh, it says that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet saying, I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things kept secret from the foundation of the world. Are you with me everyone? That's what was spoken by one of the prophets. Look at Matthew chapter 21 verse 4. Matthew chapter 21. What verse everyone? Four, and all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet saying tell the daughter of Zion behold your king is coming to you lowly and sitting on a donkey a colt the foal of a donkey Jesus went marching there into Jerusalem they were putting the palm branches down and saying Hosanna to the son of David in the highest and then Matthew says you know why that happened it was to fulfill Zechariah chapter 9 and Jesus is fulfilling the Old Testament prophecies. I mean, we could go through so many more. Chapter 26, chapter 27, again and again and again in Matthew. This happened. Why did this happen? To fulfill, to fulfill, to fulfill. Do you know what's happening, beloved? The New Testament writers are not centering their expectations of a future hope. Please don't miss what I'm about ready to say. The New Testament writers did not focus their anticipation of God's fulfillment to Israel on national Israel. The New Testament writer said all of those promises were fulfilled, yes, in Jesus. In fact, let me show you the most powerful, one of the most powerful verses, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 2. See if you can get there. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 2. And you are literally just getting the mountaintops here, beloved. I, I could spend another hour on this. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. 2 Corinthians chapter what, everyone? One. Verse 1 and look at verse 20. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20. Phenomenal, phenomenal. Put a star by it, put an X by it, underline it, put a smiley face by it, do whatever you got to do. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20. For all of the promises of God in Him, Him is Jesus, are what? Yes. yes! All of the promises of God in Him are yes, and in Him, amen, to the glory of God through us. You know what Paul's saying? He's saying not one promise of God is going to fail. Not one promise of God is going to fail. But notice what he doesn't say. He doesn't say all of the promises of God are yes in national Israel. Paul believed in Jesus. He says all of God's promises are fulfilled. All of God's promises are yes in Christ. Christ is the new Israel. Christ is the true representative of God. Christ as the one that God could look down upon and say, there he is, there's my new Adam, there's my new Noah, there's my new Israel, that's my representative, my son in whom I'm well pleased. Hear him! Now, hey, listen, if you want to go back to all those Old Testament prophecies and you want to say, oh, this is going to happen to national Israel and this is going to happen to national Israel, this is going to happen to national Israel, do you know what you're really doing? You're interpreting the Old Testament as if Jesus hadn't come. Woo, beloved, danger of dangers. You want to go understand the Old Testament in a way, as, in, in the very same way that the Jews who reject Jesus understand it? Beloved, how do the New Testament writers understand the, the Old Testament? Fulfilled in Jesus. 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 In fact, there's a couple more I just absolutely have to show you. You're there in 1 Corinthians, uh, or somewhere close to it. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Amazing. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. What chapter, everyone? 15. I'm picking it up in verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the what? The gospel which I preach to you. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1. In which uh, you received, in which you stand, by which you are saved, if you hold fast to the word which I preach to you, unless you have believed in vain. For I deliver to you, first of all, that which I also received. Now notice this. Paul says, I preach to you what was preached to me, that Christ died for our sins. What are the next four words? According to the what? Scriptures, and look at verse 4. And that he was buried and then he rose again the third day. What are the next four words? 
According to the scriptures. Okay, right here, Bible students, every one of you, show me the verse in the Old Testament that says the Messiah would die according to the scriptures, that the Messiah would be raised according to the scriptures. Show it to me. Does anybody know where it's at? No. Where is it? A very fascinating here, isn't it? I mean, he just says it plain as can be. I, uh, Paul says, hey, listen, he was, he was died according to the scriptures. He was buried according to the scriptures. He was raised according to the scriptures. Now, where is it? Where is it? Do you know where it is? Jonah. It's in Jonah. Jesus said, a wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and no sign shall be given but the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the heart of the earth, in the heart of the fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Jesus here takes a random event out of Israel's history and he applies it to himself. Are you hearing me? Oh, it gets even better. Look at Hosea. There's one other, by the way. Jonah 1.17 and look at Hosea. See if you can get there before me. Daniel, Hosea chapter 6. Hosea chapter what, everyone? Hosea chapter 6 and I'm beginning in verse 1. Look at this. Hosea chapter 6, verse 1. See, Paul is saying that the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus was anticipated by the Old Testament prophets. Look at Hosea chapter 6, verse 1. This is out of this world amazing. Hosea chapter 6, verse 1. Are we all there, everyone? Come and let us what? Return to the Lord, for He has torn us, but He will heal us. He has stricken, but He will bind us up. After two days He will revive us. On the third day He will what? Raise us up that we may live in His sight. Wait a minute. Do you know who this is a prophecy about? It's a prophecy about Jesus, but in its original context, who is it about? Israel, who went into Assyrian captivity. Israel had gone into Assyrian captivity, and the prophet Hosea, when they came out, said, two days we've been down, but on the third day we'll be raised up. And Jesus took this prophecy about national Israel after they had gone into Assyrian captivity, and he says, two days in the tomb, raised on the third. How is Jesus allowed to do this? How is Matthew allowed to do this? How is Paul allowed to do this? How are all these people allowed to start interpreting the Old Testament in a very radical way? Because they saw that all of those prophecies were fulfilled not in national Israel. Israel had its chance, just like Adam, it failed. Just like Noah, it failed. But Jesus was faithful. Jesus is the fulfillment of the New Testament. And I'm going to be strong here, and I hope you forgive me. I hope we can still be friends. But if you insist that God still has to fulfill prophes pro promises to national Israel, you are interpreting the Old Testament in a very different way than the New Testament writers did. Are you more inspired than Paul? Are you more inspired than Matthew? Are you more inspired than Jesus? Jesus understood himself as the fulfillment of the Old Testament. Paul understood Jesus as the fulfillment of the Old Testament. Matthew and the other gospel writers understood Jesus as the fulfillment of the, of the Old Testament. And yet we want to come along and say, no, Israel's the fulfillment of the Old Testament. Who? Israel had their chance as a nation and they failed. Seventy weeks were determined upon their people. The gospel has gone to the Gentiles because God has a new representative and that new representative is Jesus. Jesus said in John chapter 5 and verse 39, he was speaking to the Pharisees, he said, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. But these are they that testify of me. One last verse, Luke chapter 24. Hang in there. One last, just one last passage. Luke, what chapter, everyone? Luke chapter 24. There were two people walking on the road to Emmaus. You know the story. They're on the road to Emmaus, and Jesus pulls up next to them. He says, hey, why are you sad? Well, haven't you heard what happened? No, what happened? Well, there was a man named Jesus, and we thought he was the guy, but he was crucified, and it was always oh, a terrible situation. Now watch this. Luke chapter 24, and I am in verse 25. Then he said to them, Jesus speaking, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to have entered into his glory? You hear what he's saying? Can't you read the Old Testament? Jesus is all over the Old Testament. Look at verse 32. After he sat down with them, they turned to one another and they said, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked with us on the road and while he opened the what? The scriptures to us. What had Jesus done that had revolutionized the way they saw the scriptures? Why were their hearts burning within them? 
because they began to see Jesus was the focus of the Old Testament prophets. Jesus was the focus of the Old Testament Psalms. Jesus was the focus of the Old Testament wisdom books. Jesus, 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 all over the Old Testament. And their hearts began to burn. They said, we never saw that before.